and welcome everyone to this uh, special presentation. My name is Kevin Elson and joining us, we're very happy to have with us Bishop Robert Daly, who's the Vicar General and the moderator of the Curia here in the Archdiocese of Boston. And thank you so much for being with us, Bishop. Kevin, it's a pleasure to be with you and with Catholic TV and all the uh, viewers of Catholic TV. We thought we'd take this show to uh, talk with you, Bishop Daly. You have the uh, unique experience of working with uh, Pope Benedict XVI in the past when he was Cardinal Ratzinger in the, uh, in the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And I thought we'd just uh, talk with you a little bit about your experience there and sort of your thoughts on this whole uh, interesting scenario that's going on here with uh, Pope's uh, resignation and uh, a new Pope on the way. So maybe if we could start off uh, taking us uh, back. You're, you're the judicial vicar here in the Archdiocese of Boston. And uh, how did that all proceed? They asked you to come over and, and help out? Well, I w had been judicial vicar from 1989 to 1999. But in 1999, um, Cardinal Law uh, agreed to uh, name me a pastor. And so I was a pastor at St. Anne's in Wollaston, a very happy pastor at St. Anne's mm -hmm. in Wollaston, enjoying uh, life with the wonderful people in Quincy. And um, I got a call uh, asking if I would uh, be willing to be one of the Americans that got uh, sent over to um, Rome to help out with some of the priest cases. Um, it was the 4th of July weekend in 2004, and frankly, the only thing that was on my mind was finding somebody to make it possible for me to get to a golf tournament uh, <laughs> so I could get away for a few days. And that call came in, and of course, since then, Archbishop O'Malley asked me if I would do that. I was more than willing to, to do that uh, and use the skills of the canon law that I had had, uh, the knowledge I had in that field, and go. So I went in September. I left here uh, on the 13th of September, and I arrived in Rome on the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross. So I felt it was really under very uh, auspicious circumstances and, 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 and the blessing of the Lord to arrive on that feast. And I started work on the 15th, which was the very next day, which was the Feast of the uh, Our Lady of Sorrows. So I felt that uh, that was all uh, very propitious and, 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 uh, and good circumstances. Now, you'd, you'd been in, you'd studied in Rome previously, but had you ever been in the offices of the congregation? No, no one yeah. goes to the office of the congregation for the doctor of the faith work without there. a purpose. <laughs> you get called in there, something's wrong, Kevin. <laughs> you, you, you've said something wrong in one of your homilies or you've written something in a book that people aren't going to like. So you so have to, uh, you don't get called in there easily. <laughs> and it's not a place that you, it, it's not the chummy kind of place that you might stop in for a cup of coffee yeah. along the way. <laughs> And that's its, that's its image, but of course, once I got there, I found out there's wonderful people there, including Cardinal Ratzinger, who was then the prefect, which means the, the president, if you will, of the, uh, of the congregation. He was in charge of the congregation. And what was it like um, sort of acclimating yourself? or uh, you know, Well, into you it? know, the reputation back then, the reputation that Cardinal Ratzinger had was not always positive. And, you know, I had a little... Uh, you know, apprehension. What is this going to be like? But I'm telling you, I never met a kinder, more gentle man than, than Cardinal Ratzinger. He was, uh, I, I, I would, would have gone in on Wednesday, and on Friday we had um, kind of the equivalent of the staff meeting. You know, it was the, they call it the Congresso, but it is the meeting where you bring together all the work that you've done during the week and you bring it to the superiors for their decision and for determining what's going to happen to this particular case and um, it, whether or not it goes to the Holy Father, whether or not it needs more study, whether or not there's, there's things that need to be done. And of course the prefect presides over that meeting. He's the uh, principal person. And I was so impressed that first day to see first of all how kind he was, how thoughtful he was to the people that were in the room, how he respected what it was that they had to say. He was very he wasn't anxious to correct or to, uh, to push questions any further than the individuals who were presenting the material to him already presented. And finally, the, the, the thoughtfulness he brought to every decision that he made in relation to the ma very difficult material that we were dealing with. Uh, the concern he showed for uh, the priest uh, who was accused, but also for the victim, for the church, uh, all of that. He, it came through in such uh, strong uh, fashion right from the very beginning. Um, he's an extremely intelligent man, but he had the ability to uh, make everyone in the room feel 
as though they were part of the solution and uh, to the problem that was presented, and he respected them in, a, in an incredible way. And, and, and you worked there for just a little while, and then you went back again later? Well, I was, no, I was supposed to go temporarily. It was okay. supposed to be 18 months, and the 18 months stretched out to seven years. Okay. <laughs> when Cardinal Sean asked me to come back and take this job. Okay. Uh, after I was there about four months, uh, they asked me to uh, make up a list. I was coming home for Christmas, and, and before I came, matter of fact, I ran into Cardinal Ratzinger in the corridor about 10 days before Christmas, and uh, he said to me, uh, Monsignor Dealey, he said, uh, why are you still here? Shouldn't you be back in your parish for Christmas? And uh, that was the kind of thoughtful thing that happened. But at any rate, they asked me to make up a list. I had been president of the Canon Law Society of America, and I knew a lot of the canon lawyers in the United States, make up a list of people that they might ask to come and help us because there were openings. I was there temporarily, uh, but there were openings that they needed to fill uh, in the office itself, in the regular staff of the office. And so I gave that to the superiors before I left for Christmas. And when I came back in January, I got called in <clears throat> by one of the people, one of the priests that I worked with, uh, and he said to me, the Cardinal wants to know why your name isn't on the list. And I said, well, I'm too old, I'm, you know, give the usual excuse. Yeah. <laughs> so that didn't work. And then in the uh, process, I, I was no longer working for 18 months, but I was now an employee of the Holy See and a, a regular official of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith uh, at his request. Yeah. So I worked directly with him then for about, I guess it was about seven months altogether. Started in September and then, um, uh, and uh, he was elected in April. So. Uh, to be the Pope. And, and talk about the time when Pope John Paul II passed away and, and, and what was that like in the office? And uh, I know Cardinal Ratzinger had, had done some of the masses during the City of Acante. And uh, maybe if you get the atmosphere of that and if anybody was. It was a tremendous atmosphere in the city. It was a tremendous atmosphere. You know, it was not mournful. It wasn't, it wasn't like everyone was sad. It was like a passage because um, in February, or February 2nd, uh, Blessed uh, John Paul had had uh, an episode, uh, heart, stroke, something, uh, and they took him to the hospital. Um, and the fact that they took him to the hospital conveyed the seriousness of what had happened. And he was very seriously ill at that point. They brought him home, but everyone knew, a couple of days later they brought him home, but everyone knew that there was an inevitability and we were coming to the end of what had been a painful Calvary for him and for the church that his suffering was coming to an end. Uh, and I remember uh, I was in London uh, for Easter and uh, uh, at the cathedral there at Westminster and uh, uh, chatted with Cardinal Murphy O'Connor and uh, I said I think you should be ready because I said I think it's coming very quickly. Uh, that he is going to he's going to die, and then when I got back to Rome and we were, we had those days off over the weekend for Easter and and then we I was back in Rome, and it was like Wednesday or Thursday when it was clear that the end was coming, and people just flocked to be under his window with candles praying the rosary, just prayer, just people gathered in the square. It was really a very very beautiful thing, particularly the young people who cared so much for John Paul. And they came in great numbers, and they filled the square. Uh, and then on Saturday night, uh, we were there, um, and they announced that he had died. Um, at, uh, I think, I believe it was about 7.30 or 8 o'clock on that Saturday night. And they continued the prayer. By that time, there was a huge crowd. As we came out of the building, which was next door, of course, we kept working, and you worked on Saturdays. You had to kind of walk around all the people on the sidewalk because they were all camped out. People just came into Rome and camped out for the whole thing. Now me, everyone else in Rome I guess knew that Cardinal Ratzinger was going to get elected. I just thought this is a wonderful man I work with who can now maybe finally get to the retirement he's talked about doing. Yeah. I, I didn't know, you know what went into the whole process of electing a pope. Um, but Cardinal Ratzinger was such an important part of the transition and all that, that happened that it, it, it began to become inevitable as the week went on uh, after the funeral that 
the Holy Spirit was in a certain way with him. And, and what, what was it like when um, he was announced and, and what kind of, I don't know, the, the feeling they had in the office? Well, people in the office were telling me, you know, he's, you know it's, it's going to be Cardinal Ratz. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to the Mass on Monday morning uh, for the conclave and he gave a beautiful, beautiful homily in which he laid out, really, the state of the church and the challenges that were there and the, the good and the bad, and uh, uh, people said afterwards, well, he's just sunk himself. There's no, nobody's that honest about the problems in the church is gonna get elected, but the Cardinals had seen a man who had an extraordinary ability to listen and to help people to come together in a conversation. It's been the whole week before, uh, in these congregations, they call them, their meetings, in which all the cardinals gathered and discussed what's going on in the church. It had been 26 years since they had gathered in that way because uh, uh, John Paul had been elected in 1978 and now we're in 2005, so it had been 26 years since there had been an election. So they needed to talk and they did. They spent the whole week talking. But Cardinal Ratzinger conducted those meetings. And I watched him in the congregation on occasion conducting meetings with large groups of people with different languages. He speaks enough languages so that he's able to listen, synthesize, and turn around the, the, the discussion so that everyone understands what's going on and keep the discussion going and the, and the questions. And they tell me that in those, they can talk about those, those uh, congregations, he, w he sought out people who weren't speaking. He wanted people, some of the cardinals who hadn't spoken, he wanted, you know, in any meeting, there's always going to be one Joe that's gonna, you know, do yeah, all the yeah, talking. Yeah. But he, he, he sought out the people who weren't talking and, and, uh, and wanted, their, wanted them to get involved. And so because of his skill with languages, he could communicate with them in Latin or German or Italian or French or Spanish or Portuguese, whatever. He would, he would be able to work with them. and. Uh, so it was so that they had an extraordinary uh, vision of him uh, and of his his talents and abilities. Um, the last day of the congregations was on Saturday, April sixteenth, which is his birthday. And so they told us that uh, Archbishop Amato, who was then the secretary of the congregation, uh, told us that he would be coming uh, late in the morning uh, to. Uh, so that we could wish him a happy birthday. And we were in the room where we would gather for that, and we gave him some flowers, and there was a, you know, a greetings, Archbishop Amato extended happy birthday greetings on behalf of all of us, and he talked to us, and he was hoarse. His voice was gone. He had spent so much time talking during the week that there was very little voice left. And he had, of course, to preach on Monday. He had the, the sermon, and he asked us to pray for him that he would get his voice back and that he would be well enough to go into the thing. But he was, he was, he, you could see how tired he was from the hard work that he had done during that week, helping the cardinals to think through where the church was at and what they wanted to do as they went forth and elected. And then when he went back into his office, because the big room where we would gather for those things was right next to his office, one of my friends, one of the priests that was there, said to me, the next time we see him, he'll be in white. <laughs> really? <laughs> you got that down? So there we have it, you know. So then on Tuesday, that we had the, the, the Mass on Monday and then on Tuesday, the election, and it happened very quickly. And I know not everybody in your office was surprised, but were you surprised to see him walking out? Well, everyone <laughs> kind of knew that, the, you know, they, yeah. they kind of figured that this might be the case, but nobody knew for sure, and uh, I didn't myself. I, my thought was not that he uh, wouldn't get elected because it began to, become clear that certainly he was a very attractive candidate and, and he knew where the church was at and the problems that needed to be resolved and all the rest of that. So I had every confidence that he would be a good choice. I worried about him because of his age and his wish to have a quieter lifestyle at this point. He'd worked so hard for so many years. Uh, but uh, I wasn't even going to go down because even though the piazza is right next to the office, 
I said, well, you know, it's too soon. It's only the first day. They can't possibly have come to their conclusion already. And they said to me, you better get down here. So, uh, so uh, all of a sudden, it became clear that the smoke was the right color. So I, w I was working at my desk, and I went charging down to, to be down there for the announcement. And you wait in anticipation, total anticipation. And all you need is the first name. And as soon as they said Josephum, everyone knew that it was Ratzinger. Uh, so that's, uh, they, they give the, the, the uh, announcement in Latin, and uh, as soon as they said Josephum, they, they knew it was going to be Cardinal Ratzinger, and there was great jubilation. And, and he stopped by the office after The next morning uh, he came in to see us, uh, to, uh, to thank us for our support and to uh, speak to us that he was moving across the piazza because the Apostolic Palace is on the other side of the piazza but that uh, he was he to speak of his fondness for us, and we each had a chance personally to congratulate him. And uh, he spoke, he introduced me to Cardinal, the Cardinal next to him, telling him, you know, how I had come and helped out and how grateful he was that I had given this, this assistance to the Holy See and gave up his parish to be here and all of this. He was wonderful. Now talk about, if you can, um, Pope Benedict's uh, papacy and um, these past eight years and uh, maybe some of the things that I guess he'll, he'll be remembered for, some of his legacy that uh, people will look back and, and say how much he had contributed to the church. You know, Kevin, I would say that um, one of the things that, uh, to, to start that off, one of the things I often do before I do my Sunday, uh, before I uh, do the uh, reflection on, on the Sunday uh, readings uh, in preparing a homily, I go back three years, six years to the Sunday uh, on the Vatican website to find out what the Holy Father said at the Angelus because he is an extraordinary teacher and his command of scripture, theology, uh, and the practical pastoral life within which the people of the church live uh, is so great that he has incredible wisdom and insight. He will be known as one of the great teachers, one of the great teaching popes. Um, his, his books, his homilies, his instructions at the audiences, all of those kinds of things are extraordinary works um, which reflect who he is, what he believes, and what he wants to teach. And they're clear and uh, helpful to people uh, in his message. So he is just, an, apart from everything else that's happened, he has been an extraordinary teacher. Uh, and that's his, of course, that's who he is. Yeah. That's, that's what he did uh, when you read the milestones, his, the reflections on the first 70 years uh, of his life, he, you, you, you are struck by the fondness he gives to the, the ability to teach, to help people to understand the mystery of who Jesus is and, and what he has done for us and the theology that's, that's behind the church. And, um, he, he is an extraordinary teacher. That will be his great, his great, the thing that we will remember most about him. And is the thing I regret the most about his, his uh, retirement, his resignation, that that voice will be silenced. Uh, and he won't, he probably will not um, publish anymore, uh, lest it, he be seen as interfering in any way with the new Holy Father, uh, whom we await with anticipation. But uh, so I think the, the greatest thing in his uh, papacy will be the teaching that he has done. Um, but you go, you know, the visits that he's made, I mean, everyone, you recall that everyone thought, oh, his visit to England is going to be awful. And the people were they were mesmerized by what he had to say, the depth of his knowledge of them, as well as the content of what he was talking about. So he gives a beautiful talk to the young people, telling them that God is the only answer in a captivating way in which he uses language that they will understand and brings his theology into practical reasoning and gives a beautiful talk. And at the same time, he talks at Westminster, uh, Westminster Hall, which gives a profound speech on faith and reason and their relatedness and their importance in the world today. 
does the same thing in Germany. I mean, the, the, the kinds of teachings that he, that he did is just extraordinary. When you, you were talking to when you were, at, you were at the congregation, and you know, he was getting on in years, and a lot of people, too, when, when there, the election was taking place, the conclave was happening, and people were speculating that because he, of his age that they might not uh, elect him as pope. But were you surprised when he became pope and he continued uh, the travels, the, the, the going, um, you know, keeping World Youth Day going and, and the many places that he traveled, uh, even in his older age? I, I, I really wasn't surprised because I, I think when he said yes, when he said to the cardinals, accepto, I accept, um, I think he knew that that's what he, that, that what he had envisioned for himself was no longer going to be what it would be. And, and so this was his newest cross. This was the newest way in which God was calling him to give of himself. And he accepted it willingly. And therefore, with it went all of those things, those trips, those journeys, which um, by nature he would not have necessarily made. He, you may recall, even before he was, uh, around um, two or three years before he was elected, he had already curtailed making long trips um, he had been invited, he had spoke, spoken a couple of times in the United States, but he had, he had written to people and said, I can no longer make that journey. And yet he made it to Mexico, to, uh, to, uh, 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 to the United States, to, to South America, uh, to Africa, uh, to all of these places. To, he, he traveled transatlantic, transcontinental, even though he had decided that it wasn't the best thing for him to do. And I think one of the reasons why he has decided to resign is that he realizes that he really can't do that anymore. Um, it's too dangerous for his health. And so uh, he has decided that if I can't do the job that the Lord has called me to, then I should resign. And maybe talk about that uh, resignation as well uh, and what your feelings on it and um, how that affects the church in the future and, and what does that does that set up a precedent now for people that uh, are popes that are elected that might feel that they can't uphold the office well I think there's that I think there's, there's that but I think to start off with I read an article recently where uh, the uh, the author of the article points out that this is the ultimate Vatican II gesture this is the ultimate interpretation of the Second Vatican Council because the Second Vatican Council invited bishops to submit their resignations at 75 and then later that was codified into law. Paul VI decided that cardinals would only vote until they were 80, uh, recognizing that in our modern world people live longer and, uh, and, and, but that doesn't necessarily mean that their abilities are commensurate in, with their age. I mean, we usually tend to pull back from responsibility the older we get just because we don't have the same ability to do things. Um, and in this case, he has made the decision that the Holy Father is included among the leaders of the church who are asked to give consideration to the possibility of resigning when they can no longer fulfill the office as they see it. Rather, so rather than hobble along at half speed, which would be fine with most of us, uh, he feels that it, it needs the vitality of a new person to do it. So though it's shocking and has never happened in the same way before, it's not that it hasn't happened for 600 years. It's really that, it, that a pope who has actually possessed the office, done the job, and carried it out in the magnificent way in which he has, uh, has actually made a decision of his own to leave. If you look at history, you won't find any of the other people involved as having made a decision that way. There were other reasons why they resigned. So this is really a first. Um, and so it, it's very much in keeping, though, with the way in which the council called the bishops to think about how they could better carry out their responsibilities. So does it set a precedent? possibly, um, and, uh, and it could put pressure on someone else to resign who didn't want to resign in the future, but uh, 
we would hope that the, that that person, that new Holy Father, would come to his conclusion in the same prayerful, reflective manner that, that, that Pope Benedict has. When he said last Sunday at the audience that, uh, that God was leading him in this direction, you believe that in fact he is speaking the, the truth of his prayer. This is a man who knows the God he serves intimately. Uh, and uh, he understands that God is calling him in this direction. And maybe you could, Bishop, um, uh, think about um, what the Pope's going through right now as he prepares for his, uh, I guess, Pope Emeritus uh, is what he will be called. But uh, I know he uh, was thinking that being um, a source of prayer for the church in his retirement as well as uh, being able to offer his prayers and sort of take that step back as well. Well, that, that's wonderful, Kevin. I hadn't thought of that, you know, but what you just said is really interesting because, you know, the house that he's going to live in, uh, Blessed John Paul II made into a, um, a monastic enclosure uh, where different groups of sisters, mon uh, uh, monastic enclosed sisters from, from around the world came and spent uh, periods of time in the Vatican. So that within the Vatican there was a cloistered community which was praying for the church. Um, and it worked out all right for a while, but over time it became more difficult to ask the sisters who had lived in community in their various countries to, uh, to, to uproot themselves from that and to come and live in the Vatican. It was a different kind of, it's right in the city. It was a different kind of life, a different kind of world. And so now you have a monastic enclosure inside the Vatican, uh, which the Holy Father will be the, the principal prayer, but he will be joined, as I understand it, by the women of Memoris Domini who have been taking care of him and who've prayed with him and who have uh, formed a, 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 a prayer group with him uh, when he was in the Apostolic Palace, they will continue to live with him and, and uh, his secretary, now Archbishop Ganswein, will continue to live with him. So he will have a small community which will be a community of prayer. And I presume he will continue to read and he will continue to do some writing, though he probably won't make it public. Um, but he will, you know, he, he clearly sees himself as diminished, as not able to do what he once did but he can join us in prayer and he will be close to us in prayer and for that we can thank god and we thank you bishop deal for joining us today and sharing your thoughts and insights on the pope thank you thank you very much kevin i enjoyed it very much thank you and we thank you as well and uh, we wish you all the very best god bless